Hello and welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today we're joined with uh, Bob from Elijah's Cloak, a man of great wealth of knowledge when it comes to many topics of faith, of prophecy, and everything else you could probably find in his own channel. I'm certainly going through a lot of the videos just now, and he's joining us today to discuss a few things of topic. I just first of all, want to say welcome back, Bob. It's great to have you back. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's my pleasure to be here. It's always fun speaking with you and your audience. Yeah, you're welcome anytime, my friend. It's been really good watching your recent videos, as I was saying just before, the one with Archbishop Fulton Sheen and the quotes of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Absolutely good thing to keep a hold of and watch. So I'd say everyone to check out Bob's channel at Elijah's Cloak. There's a lot of knowledge to gain there as well. But for this episode, Bob, uh, we're going to discuss a couple of topics. It's a kind of couple of top hot topics, such as the Pope reaching out to Ukraine. And we know there's a lot encompassing around Russia, Ukraine, not just with what's happening in the present moment in the world, but the fact that so many prophecies always point to you uh, to Russia. But also there's a hot topic of this approaching eclipse coming just after Divine Mercy Sunday. And hopefully if we get time to it, we'll get to a little bit of Garabandal and the Medjugorje secrets. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. So okay. let's let's get going then. We'll talk about the Pope reaching out to Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, what can you tell us? So right before the rumor broke about him going to Moscow, which kind of overshadowed the fact that he reached out to Ukraine, he sent a message to Ukraine, which wasn't well received. He said that Ukraine should consider hoisting the flag, the white flag of negotiations. And the white flag throughout, I think most of most nations refers to surrender, not negotiations. So they're very unhappy with that. And basically they, told the Pope not to interfere. Now, he tried to explain also that he was speaking of negotiations and negotiations does not mean surrender. But at the same time he was explaining that, he did it in the context of saying, when it appears that you're defeated and it's not going well, then negotiations are something you should consider and negotiations are not surrender. So people were criticizing that, saying that it's very, very awkward statement for him to make to suggest that they raise the white flag, and um, which indicates surrender. And, that, and that's how Ukraine took it as well. So he didn't make any friends with Ukrainian government in doing that. Now, in thinking about that a little bit, I don't agree the fact that it was just an awkward statement because the Vatican is very good at diplomacy. They have a State Department, you know, what most nations would consider their State Department, and they're very good at it. So I don't believe it was just an awkward statement. And I think what he was doing is actually he was ingratiating himself with the Russians he wanted to give a message that the Russians would find favorable. And as everyone knows, he's been trying to get to Moscow for I don't know how long now, years in his pontificate. He's been trying to schedule something with either the Orthodox Church or with Vladimir Putin. And the latest I heard is that there's still talks about it, but nothing's been settled. Now, the other thing about these rumors is there was a rumor, I think about seven or nine months ago, it was the same thing that he's going to Moscow, um, but it wasn't true back then. And we know today that the rumor of him going to Moscow now is not true. And the uh, thing to remember is the Vatican also has a press secretary. <laughs> He's not going to go to Moscow without them announcing it. 
So, and if they don't announce it, I'm not going to believe it. So we have to be, we have to consider the fact that, you know, they're going to say something publicly. It's not something they can do in a clandestine manner. They can't do this in the secret. It's too big for them to do in secret. So they definitely will announce it. And when they do that, that's, I think, when we should really believe it. Otherwise, when these rumors come around, I'm more than skeptical. <laughs> do, you think, I, I although it's, do you think, although it's been refuted, there's a, there's something probably brewing in the background? Is that what you're thinking? Well, there definitely is something brewing in the background. He's been trying to get to Moscow for a long time. And the last I heard, there were, were talks about it, but they're not definitive. And and I think in looking at you know, what I've seen from the war between Ukraine and, and Russia, the Russians always seem to leave a door open to negotiate. Like they'll speak with anyone. They'll like, speak with Turkey. They'll speak with China. They'll, they'll talk to anyone about negotiation doesn't mean that they're going to provide what the other side wants, but they always leave a door open. So they never say just yet, you know, no talks. So I'm not sure if they want to meet with the Pope or not. Uh, the, the other thing is, from the Orthodox side of it, the Orthodox, because of events that have happened recently in the Roman Catholic Church, they've taken a position where they're kind of standoffish when it comes to this pontificate. And one of the problems that they have, it actually started with the Pachamama scandal that occurred in the Vatican, and also just recently with fiducia supplicants, where I think, Mark, you mentioned also that I've seen that on your channel, that the Coptic bishops they've uh, backed out of negotiations with Rome or talks with Rome, and that's just one 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 example out of this. So most of the Eastern bishops in the Roman Catholic Rite and they rejected, you know, that document, and the Orthodox have rejected it, and I've even heard. I've heard Protestants complaining about it. So when the Protestants are complaining about something being not Orthodox, <laughs> I think we have a problem. Yeah, but, um, yeah. yeah, but I think it. I think it's really interesting. Also, I remember when um, Pope Francis went to Greece. I think it was right after. He introduced the, the Pacha Mama statue into the Vatican. I think one of there was a video of some priest, an Orthodox priest, yelling at him that he was a heretic as, as he was going from one place to another. So there's definitely, you know, they're not happy with this pontificate, and it makes it less likely for him to actually go to Moscow. But more than likely, I'm thinking that if he does go to Moscow, it's going to be because of the war itself and perhaps to meet with Putin instead of the Orthodox there. What I, do you I think, Mark? I can see how the Pope could go to Moscow even for the big Jubilee next year, for example, or for any other reason that's based on the churches meeting you can't get the Pope as head of state going to Russia in a historic visit and not meet the president of Russia. I, I can't see how that could happen. I think it's too big. And the fact that Vladimir Putin's been to the Vatican several times, he's had an audience with John Paul II, Benedict and Francis on several occasions. Yes. He's no stranger to meeting the Pope, even when he's there for, well, when he was still part of the G8 or the G20 type uh, meetings before the war happened and they seem to have shunned him from such meetings. 
even if it was in Italy in government business, it would still have the detour to the Vatican. And uh, I remember actually one time was when I was a seminarian, we were coming out of the university, which is quite central in Rome. And as always, you see the more motorcades and all that back and forth with diplomats here and there. And you could see that there's a big entourage when it came to Vladimir Putin going to meet the Pope. So he's no stranger to the Vatican. I th I, there's rumours that even asked about the apparitions of Fatima and that to Pope Francis, where Francis kind of shut it down. Uh, again, I'll say unconfirmed reports, because that seems to be the word just now this week with <laughs> unconfirmed reports. <laughs> we'll get to that in a bit. But can back before I forget when he says it, how he says about raising the white flag. Of course, you're thinking straight away surrender. But even if that was the case, then anyone with common sense and looking away from the, the Western media, they know the fact that Ukraine's just putting fuel in the fire. They, they can't win. And that's why the West is making this yeah. a proxy war. So surrender, in a way, is saving a lot of lives. And we've already seen clips of certain government officials such as Robert, Robert Kennedy Jr., I think, and he says that how Boris Johnson went over at the behest of Biden over a year ago, where Zelensky was ready to sign the peace papers, Vladimir Putin already took some troops back, withdrew them as an act of goodwill, but then Johnson went over and got him to tear up the paper, so that's why Putin came back with the, the army. So if that's all true, it's a case of why are the West pushing to keep this going? And again, it's like it, we've got enough history to know their way, this war machine that's there with those that are corrupting the, at the top. But uh, this idea of the white flag isn't about surrender, it's about negotiation. That reminded me, actually, in my simple mind. Do you remember the movie of Mel Gibson, The Patriot? Yeah. That's exactly what happened in that movie. And um, he goes with the two great Danes and the horse with the stick and the white flag. And the British are saying there's a rider approaching with the white flag of truce. It was a truce. That's why they couldn't touch him under the way of command. Because he spoke and all they had was negotiations between the leader of the British um, army and him, who was the head of the, I don't know what they called it, like the rebellion or something like that. Um, yeah. All the men came together. But when he was leaving, the bad guy on the British side was trying to trigger him into do something, you know, fight. But that's when the captain says he's here under a banner of truce. You can't yes. you have to let him go. So um, that, that was a bit in the movie when you realise, well, it is negotiation. And the fact you've mm -hmm. came with a white flag, it cannot be touched under the code of, you know, war. You can't be touched because of that banner of truce. So, yeah, it is historic, and I dare say many people have forgotten about that historic significance, is the fact it's there for negotiation as well. You pose no threat. You're there to negotiate, and that's what that scene was in the movie. That was a great movie. Mel Gibson was doing great back then until they, they banished them from Hollywood after the Passion of the Christ movie. So I recommend people to watch it, and you'll see exactly that white flag. Um, being raised for negotiations. Yeah, that's a good movie about the American Revolutionary War. Yeah, that's right. But uh, I, I, I agree with you, Bob. I think um, the Vatican know how to use words in diplomacy. I think I read once that out of all the, the countries in the world, Vatican State has more diplomatic relationships than any other country because it is its sovereign nation itself. Um, and the fact that it can get in there because it's talking about peace and love and social justice, etc. There's no need to worry about it with arms and wars. It seems to get a bit more an easy spread because of that. And um, yes, again, in summary, we would see the odd diplomat or the Chateau d'Affaire, or have you pronounced them, coming to, to visit the seminaries and things. So there was a sense of politics, diplomacy, bureaucracy, even round about the church in Rome as well because of its ties to the nations. And I think it's been well planned because although Ukraine took it the wrong way straight away, Russia actually quoted saying it was understanding what the Pope had said. Now, whether they also took it in terms of surrender, 
they can understand that because they know they ain't losing this war. But at the other sign, the other way, if they actually saw the meaning of it, so Zelensky's invited the Pope Francis quite a few times over to Ukraine, but he doesn't want to just go to Ukraine without going to Moscow, and that's what's holding things up. He wants it for both. So you've got the welcome committee at Ukraine not happy at his comment, but you've got the the Russians who apparently haven't sent any invitations all of a sudden welcome him, what he's saying. So you can see the chess piece there, a bit of balance maybe if it's going to be a, a diplomatic rendezvous type idea that they're yeah. trying. So he really wants to go to Moscow and I have the impression that if Moscow asked him to go there and Ukraine did not, he would go anyway. <laughs> because he really wants to go there. And so it makes you wonder why why is there the strong desire to go to Moscow? It's almost like it's been driven by heaven, because that's part of the Garibaldi prophecies, right? That the Pope will return from Moscow. And some have said that Pope Francis actually wants to fulfill that prophecy. Now, I'm not so sure about that. And the reason being is that when he did the consecration of Russia to Immaculate Heart back um, a year ago now, he was asked why he did it, and his response was, because the bishops of Ukraine asked me to do it. It's a matter of collegiality. So it wasn't, I think, it probably wasn't the best answer, so... He didn't say, like, it's because it was heaven's desire for this to happen or I'm fulfilling the wish of our Blessed Mother. He's saying that he did it out of collegiality. So it makes me wonder about what the motive is for going to Moscow if it isn't something similar where he wishes to be perceived as the main person, the main person when it comes to religion the main character. So he wants to be perceived as a person who has other religions underneath him. And um, the Orthodox, as I mentioned, they seem to be moving away, or actually that's not true. We're moving away from them, where is accurate. Um, and they don't seem to appreciate it. They, they view it as union as being less likely. Now, there still can be collaboration, which you know we call ecumenism, but I think that that's kind of, you know, stilled the, or it muddied the waters, you know, regarding us and union with the Orthodox, which is unfortunate. Now, the fact that next year you have the, the Jubilee and Easter on the same date, that's another possibility of why it may happen. But my thinking is that Pope Francis wants to do it for that reason. He wants to be perceived as the person who is the most important when it comes to religion, even for religions that are not Catholic, Roman Catholic. So, yeah. in thinking about that regarding Garabandal, so that's a, a way of maybe bringing that in a little bit. Um, one of the interesting things about that prophecy, and I think we talked about this before, I might be wrong, but it it's a prophecy that appeared in one book. I think it was The Finger of God by Albright Weber. And in the latest edition, he took that reference isn't there about the Pope going to Moscow and coming back. So it makes me wonder, is there another source for that? I'm not aware of another source. And I'm wondering, I kind of take these prophecies from Garibandal, I, I, I kind of have them prioritized. Like, what's a prophecy I really believe in <laughs> and that I'm sure is a real prophecy? 
and what's a prophecy that maybe isn't that well documented or doesn't have as many sources as I'd like to see so that it could be confirmed. And the prophecy about the Pope going to Moscow is probably at the bottom of that list because it, as far as I know, there's one one source and that information has been removed from the latest edition of his book. So it makes me wonder about that completely. Yeah, I wonder why he's done that. Because it's the one thing people are holding on to. And the interview speaks for itself. I did uh, over a year ago with Glenn Hudson, who many know does a lot of the Garabandal apostolate on behalf of Conchita and that online. But it's the one thing, again, it seems to be waiting for is the Pope going to Moscow. He doesn't seem to entertain too much of anything until he sees that. So it would be an interesting question maybe to ask him even or anyone else. Yeah, as yeah well, I think it is. Why is that being removed in the new edition? Yeah, it is a, a good question. And um, it's the last thing, right? It's the last prophecy. Anything left to happen. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> we could be surprised if it's a prophecy that's maybe not real. So, yeah, it is a question I'd, I'd like to have an answer to. Yeah, I think the sources that we have regarding the Garabandal prophecies, I'd need to revise it again, but over the years reading and then watching a lot of things and getting good sources and that, the ma no matter how many times you get the information, sometimes you need to look back. There's always something that needs correcting. I, I really found that with Garabandal, unlike any other apparition site. The more questions I get on this or on the Facebook group page, Marian Apparitions, it's always the same questions with Garabandal that people need to rehear it or understand it again. Like that just chronological of events or the few criteria that needs to be in place. You know, such as like the four popes, what comes first, the warning of the miracle, what's this about, you know, the times of the martyr, Eucharist. They get everything kind of mixed up quite often. I, I did that a few times myself, but you just have it a list, writing it down in the book, highlight it and go back to it as many times you need to until it's, it's clearly there. But it seems to be like there's a deduction going on in terms of the books or the odd interview and what's been said through the third party who's then wrote about it or spoke to someone else and they've wrote about it. You know, it's, it's an even year. It's um, the Pope going to Moscow. It, it's like the amount of, if that was the case, the, I would expect within the next 12 to 24 months for the Pope, like you say, there's no better reason than the Pope going to Moscow for a great historic visit than the big jubilee next yes. year. Yes, know? except if he does it because he, he's trying to negotiate peace, yeah. which could be. If there seems I, like there's going to be an escalation in the war, that may prompt the visit also. Especially with President Macron of France kind of poking the fire a little bit recently with his comments and French troops and all the rest of it. Because again, marie Julie Jehenny, I'm sure it was quoted, well, she's attributed as saying that it's France that is the spark when it comes into Europe. There's, oh, there was another boy. one that was shared with me today about a man I've never heard of, and again, it's a surprise attack from Russia. And when I hear of that surprise attack of Russia hitting Europe, if it takes NATO by surprise, I would say it's imminent because, and I'm not saying this to make doom and gloom or to make any sensationalist hype or worry or anything like that. I'm just using the cogwheels thinking when I'm, I'm listening or reading. January, we had the World Economic Forum. Then round about the same time period, just a couple of months ago in January, we have the head of NATO. I mean, you see it in his face. You know, we are not in peace. We can assume it's clear. That's why we make the plans. You know, this is the stuff he was saying. You know, have a flashlight, have a couple of things like radios just to get you back. This is what this head of NATO was saying in January, uh, just several weeks ago. And um, they're on about conscription. We're, we've heard the word conscription being mentioned over here in the UK as a couple of other European nations already. They're firing in... Finland and Sweden to join NATO as well now, ever since this Ukraine proxy wars happened. And um, 
then you hear this about the French president. So this head of NATO was saying, you know, in two to three years' time, we very well could be at war with Russia. Macron yes. speaks about it as an existential threat, Russia, as to us. So it's kind of it's kind of like it's a their view of things is actually going to precipitate is more likely to precipitate what they dread or what they supposedly dread, which is a war with Russia. But what now, comes to me though, if it, if it just says the fact that if they're expecting it with all their intelligence and everything else that makes them say two to three years time, that's when Russia could be ready for NATO. I don't know what they're basing that on, or maybe that's about how long they need to be ready for Russia. <laughs> If I'm sent as President Putin right now, I was like, why would I give them the two to three years that they need? Why would I not strike now while they've got a chance in my favour? Let me give you a little history. I have to take us by surprise, remember. I'm not saying it's there tomorrow, but why two or three years' time just because that's what NATO expects? So this sounds like a lot of nonsense that we've heard from supposedly diplomats and leaders in Europe back in World War One. So in World War One, it was a, a sequence of colossal failures and stupid moves by the, the leaders of different nations in, in Europe that led to World War One. And what happened in World War One, Germany was concerned because Russia was mobilizing in other words, Russia was building up his army. And Russia had, at that time, it had a treaty with France, believe it or not. <laughs> it's completely turned around 360, right? Or 180, I should say. So what Germany ended up doing, because they were afraid that Russia would attack them when they didn't attack them, Germany actually went into France and attacked France, the ally of Russia, first so they wouldn't be surrounded. <laughs> I, I'd laugh, but I, sh I shouldn't laugh. But it's so stupid. You have nothing else. There's nothing else you can do. Not only did they do that, but they went through Belgium, which was an ally of England, when they attacked France. So they just didn't attack France. They went through Belgium. And um, that brought England into the war. And of course, because they attacked France, they were then at war with Russia. And next thing you know, you're in World War One, which was a terrible war. I see the same things happening. It, it's, uh, I think we have to look at it, and we should, from the perspective of the faith and the warnings we received about the, the need for Russia to convert as one, and also how that fits into what's happening. When it really comes down to it, the leaders of nations on the West, and I'm including the United States in it, they're speaking nonsense. It's really, it's really nonsensical, the positions that they're taking. We have to be prepared because Russia is going to attack us. Okay, we'll be prepared. Doesn't mean you need to be at war. We're in a proxy war with Russia. And the idea of France sending troops into Ukraine they're just going to get killed there, like the Ukrainian armies. There's 500,000 people dead. I'm not talking about casualties or displaced people. I'm talking about 500,000 people dead in the Ukrainian-Russian war. Vast majority of Ukrainians. Now you send troops in there from what other, you know any country, and let's talk about France because he's the one speaking about it. What do you do when they get killed? What happens whether it's just perceived or maybe it really does happen because there's some tax that occur in Russia itself against some Russian cities and, and infrastructure. Suppose the Russians view it as coming from France. and Maybe they're wrong about that. Maybe they're right. It doesn't matter. But they perceive it to be that way. What do they do about it? There's a good possibility they're going to retaliate. It's not going to be retaliation against Ukraine. It's going to be retaliation against France. So you're willing to 
give up Lyon for a Russian city, an attack on a Russian city? And what do you do if there's retaliation against a city like Lyon or maybe some military assets that the French have? What happens after that? What's the next step? Next, ge- next step is not pretty. The next step is going to be more retaliation and escalation and a lot of people dead. And they're not, the French are not prepared to make that kind of gamble and make that trade off, at least in my mind. I don't think anyone is. And nobody wants that. Nobody that I know wants that to happen. I don't think the Russians want it to happen. I don't think the French want it to happen. But for some reason, we have these psychopaths that are leading the nations in Europe, especially. They're saying things like this. And I think that they're crazy. And the best thing that the citizens of a place like France can do is change their government, get those people out of there. They're going to be nothing but grief. And look at, at Germany. You know, they had cheap gas coming from Russia. Now well, it's not there anymore. They elect to send their their leper tanks over into Russia and or in Ukraine, I should say. And Ukraine has become a graveyard for leper tanks. So what what's the what's the point? And they're depleting their own military. So if, if Russia is building up these nations are depleting their militaries by sending armament over into Ukraine that gets destroyed. Yeah. So it does not make you know any sense. The only sense it makes is if you look at it through the faith. You look at it from a spiritual perspective. You look at it like this could be the onset of a chastisement, and which would be a World War Three. World War Three, that is not going to be like World War Two. You know, World War Two, where you have armies marching across Europe. Those mar- those armies, once they start marching across Europe, they're going to be destroyed because we have the ability now to see everything in, in detail and to see movements of troops and the congregation of troops. They're not going to last. They're not going to make it to wherever they think they're going. The same thing with some of our military assets. It's not the it's not the time today where battles are going to be won with things like aircraft carriers. They're just, as we say in the United States, they're sitting ducks out there. They're bullseyes that are floating there, and they're easy targets. In a real world war between superpowers, they wouldn't last long at all. I mean, they wouldn't even last a few days. They'd be gone. So, you know, how do you... So the vision, I think, that some of these people have that have not known war, even though World War II was fought on in their nations, that was done by the previous generation, and they don't know war, and they don't understand. The ones that do have an idea about it are thinking along the lines of, of World War II. Now, World War, now, in Ukraine, you could argue that it is kind of like World War II, although it's not because there's a lot of technology being used. But one of the factors is it's a contained war, which could become uncontained with any stupid mistake that's done by one side or the other. Yeah, well, I know when I had a Xavier Aral on back the first time, even months ago, uh, the end of last year, he say, he was quoting some general of NATO as well, saying, like, if you look at France, Britain, like maybe Germany, each country couldn't last more than seven or eight days of their own supplies a, in a war. And yet we just keep giving it away, like you say, depleting it with the Ukraine stuff. There must be a reason behind it that we're unaware of, you know, the classifieds or something. But we know everything's coming to the point where we've got it from dozens of sources of saints and mystics, apparitions that are saying a lot. But then it comes to that point where it's that one thing we are waiting of Garabandal with the Pope going to Moscow. And the stage is set for it to happen, either for one or two reasons. The Jubilee 
or if things are getting worse with the war and he's there as a sense of peace, probably do a two and one next year, maybe. Now, if if all that's coming and we're get from blessed Elena Aelio to Garabandal, from blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich to some of these new ones like with De Maria or somewhere like that, what is it there for that? There's all these people claiming to have apparitions or mystical experiences popping up left, right and centre, I think. And I don't read them all. I don't have the time. But I'm aware of them. But all of them seem to keep pointing to what's going to happen. But you never hear that in Medjugorje. You never never hear about a warning of this calamity or this war or these divine punishments. You just hear of dear children... This is a time of grace. Pray, pray, pray. You know, in the recent message to Mariana, again, everyone's waiting for the March 18th message. And that final line summed it up. Victory is in love. So what is it she's focusing? I mean, if she really is appearing in all these places for different strategies, for different reasons, but God's willing, or we've got something where the focus should be, which is the faith and the messages. That's why she doesn't focus on the secrets. That's why Mariana doesn't focus on the secrets because that isn't bringing around the renewal of faith or the the heart of the person. But nevertheless, these things are going to happen according to these secrets. And to remember Mariana, I'm sure she says that the first two secrets are there to bring a shock to the world. We need to be wakened up to realise that God is real, that we're not relying on him, that we're not focused on him. And then comes the third secret, which was allowed to be revealed as the permanent sign, which echoes that of Garabandal back in the 60s. I think the warning could be contained in one or the first or second secret of Garabandal, which would be enough to shake the world up. But what could the other one be? So the, so the first one, my, my thought is there's a mention of an upheaval and it kind of corresponds to what we know from Garabandal. First of all, I want to make a bold statement. I think we already know the secrets of Medjugorje and because right. most, of the, most of them have been told at Garabandal. Okay. Well, I'd like to hear it. I mean, you're saying it, not me, so you go for it. <laughs> so the first one, we hear that there will be an upheaval, that Mariana had a vision of an upheaval in a part of the world. And you could say it's already happening, but it's not the one she's speaking of because it wasn't announced. So that corresponds to what we hear about Garibondal and the Pope coming back from Moscow. And the thing about the Pope coming back from Moscow is that after he comes back from Moscow, there's supposed to be a breakout hostilities, which sounds like an upheaval to me. Now, we don't know where. It could be coming out of Ukraine and Russia, or it could be somewhere else. But that would mean that the second secret would be the warning, and the third secret we know is the permanent signs because it's been revealed. And the permanent sign, I think we talked about that before. If there's a permanent sign there at Medjugorje, maybe there's something similar to the Garabondo miracle there as well and other places where our Blessed Mother has appeared. So the other secrets that we know of that are considered to be grave secrets, and number seven was one of them. I think number eight might be wrong about that. But there's definitely grave secret secrets at the end. And we know that there's chastisements. There's a, a chastisement that's been mentioned at Garabandal. And we know there's many prophecies about fire falling from the sky, which was mentioned at Garabandal, and Akita, mentioned by a variety of mystics, including Maria Julie Jenny, um, Padre Pio. And so, and we understand from Padre Pio and Marie Julie Johanny that there is a relationship between the three days of darkness and the fire falling from the skies. It sounds like the same event. 
So we know that there's chastisements, and I believe that they're part of the Medjugorje secrets. And I always said that Garibandal announced the future, our Blessed Mother announced the future, and in Medjugorje, our Blessed Mother is walking us through it. She's going to be here with us as we go through that. Yeah, I mean, and also like uh, Mariana says, like she quoted our lady saying, once the events of the secrets come to pass, Satan's power is gone. And then we enter that triumph of the Immaculate Heart, the era of peace. So, I mean, I would say even towards the end of those secrets, it wouldn't be wrong to think that one secret possibly is also the three days of darkness. But yes. I, think, I think there's a reason why all the warnings have came over time to the previous generations, the past century, at least, or especially the past century or so. And now that we are the generation that are going to probably see it come to pass, that's why she's not focusing on the warnings, perhaps. She's done all that before and we have the resources I think the reason for the focus on the pray, fast, conversion, monthly confession, reading your holy scriptures, having God consume you the way it was originally intended as one, you and the Lord as one, and all that Christ paid for us on the cross, the love, the supernatural faith that this generation seems to not have compared to what may have been from before with the saints and doctors of the church. But we are in the time that she's creating us for saints. The saints of yesteryears are looking towards these times saying, I wish I was born then. They wish they were born in our time. And I think when people say, oh, why is she appearing so long? Well, why couldn't she appear so long? Who's to say she can't do it? Why are we putting her in a little robotic type of machine and she can only do it this way and she can only come that amount of times she can only say this who are we to to contain that if god wills her to be there and medjugorje isn't the longest apparition a lady of laos uh so 53 54 years or something it's approved so medjugorje isn't the longest but i think this is her walking us through and preparing our hearts which are more better than preparing our garages with food and water and preparing our bug out bags when it all hits. It's the fact that even if we're called to martyrdom, we're ready for it. We're ready to give our lives as Christ gave his life for us. And I think that depth that we're all invited to, that deep union with God is what the focus is now. She's told us what was coming and now it's here. And this is how she's preparing us for. And we'll walk through it smiling as children of God who listened and who put into practice what our Blessed Mother asked us. And I, I think I'm sensing more and more that's the plan of how she's done it the past century. Yeah, we're definitely in a period of purification. And you mentioned that you mentioned that it's not the same as it used to be in previous generations, and we are going through an apostasy, which is also a chastisement. And the way I look at it, you know, in regards to this, and also what we just discussed, where you see people that should know better making stupid mistakes and blunders, it's really a matter of we've exchanged the crown of illumination for a crown of darkness. And we're, we're bumbling around like blind people, not understanding spiritual nature of our existence, and also not understanding some things that common sense would lead us to believe or the natural law. So that's a condition that we're in now, and you can look at that as part of the purification. It's like we're starting at the, the tabla blanca, the clean slate, you know, and we're, we're basically purifying ourselves. Well, not ourselves necessarily, but we're going through a period of purification. And 
that's all leading us to one end, which is a triumph of our Blessed Mother's Immaculate Heart, which she said would occur and will occur. And that, of course, is, you know, as I have been saying, the era of the divine will, which also will occur. And they're actually the same thing. So this period we have to go through, it's like the French say, you have to break some eggs to make an omelet. And I think that's what's happening. And unfortunately, we're not responding to the real reason why our Blessed Mother is coming. And that is to live the messages that she has of conversion and prayer and to live the gospel. And we're not doing that. Wow. So inevitably, we've missed what heaven always does is when they talk about chastisements, there's an if behind there. If you don't do this, then this will occur. We're not living up to the if. You know, we're failing again and again. Like, even if Fatima, which was a tremendous public, a public apparition that is astounding. And <clears throat> We couldn't make a, a simple prayer, the 15 minute prayer, to consecrate Russia. And it was only after World War II, Pope Pius XII attempted it, but he didn't do it according to the wishes that we've heard from our Blessed Mother. And he achieved what I call partial credit for it. So the Lord told Sister Lucia that he was short in the war, the war because of it. But it didn't stop the war. It, the war could have been prevented if we just did this 15-minute prayer with the bishops of the world. Yeah. So we're feeling on the if. And we didn't even read the third secret in 1960 like heaven requested. Now, I know that the third secret's embarrassing to the church, but... It's a matter of humility and obedience to do so, and we didn't do it. So that's another problem that we have. It just made the world more difficult. Yeah, I mean, that's one. That's a hot topic on its own, whether the consecration was done or not, because when Pope Pius XII tried it, and I don't know how many before or since, but... I mean, the big one seems to be in favour of John Paul II doing it in the 1980s. I think it was 84, maybe. And there's a lot to back him up because he was shot in the Fatima feast day in May 13th, 1981. Then a few weeks later, our lady starts appearing in Medjugorje. But a lot of people say, no, he didn't say Russia specifically. Let's say it wasn't done right, but let's say... At the end of the day, if 1960 was the deadline, he's nearly a quarter of a century too late. Communism spread its errors from Russia, as Our Lady says it would. But then obviously the Soviet Empire eventually did crumble and people saw that as evidence of grace that Our Lady answered. And there are people on record saying they heard it from Lucia that was accepted. So why is Russia back in... Where's the... Where's the Where's the turnaround? Where's the conversion of Russia? Now Russia's at war. And I don't blame Russia doing what they're doing because I've been telling the West for years and years stop coming to our border. So I get that. I'm not in favour of the war. I'm not Putin's fan. But I get it if that's the reason. And um, I want to just read this little bit of the book on that note. It's from this very old book I found in the shelf. Mm -hmm. Lady and Fatima, Prophecies of Tragedy or Hope. And this one page that really stood out to me, it was Jesus speaking to Lysia, and it's from her memoirs on page 412 to 414. Because I want my whole church to acknowledge that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so as to subsequently extend the devotion to it, and place it alongside the devotion to my sacred heart. But, my God, the Holy Father will not believe me unless you move him with a special inspiration, Lucia says. 
The Holy Father, this is Jesus responding, pray very much for the Holy Father. He will do it, but it will be late. Nevertheless, the Immaculate Heart of Mary will save Russia, which has been entrusted to it. Now, that's from her memoirs quoted in that book. If it was too late by 1984, because errors had spread for nearly a quarter of a century, and I would say those errors are manifested in the West, not in Russia anymore, the spirit of communism, which is the thing that's to return, according to Garabandal and Lucia. Well, what is communism? Where's it coming from in terms of all these democratic Western nations? But you can see the undercurrent, it's just a different mask. Let's say that wasn't the right one in the 1980s, and then you've got the one Pope Francis did. Yeah, he said Ukraine and Russia, that doesn't count. I'm not letting OCD get carried away with that. But when you get back, some say if you get back to 1917, and I didn't research this myself, again, it's top of my head, but back in 1917, those territories together would have been Russia. So I don't mind the fact that he said Ukraine and Russia for that reason, but nevertheless, according to Jesus, it will be said when it's too late. So again, if Russia's in the war, for, if had 20 years to listen to us, stop coming to our borders with all your missiles and NATO countries extending more and more, and when they do attack Ukraine because of that defence reason, NATO add Finland and Sweden. So Russia's surrounded in the West and not so much yeah. better in the East when you take in the other allied nations from Australia to Guam to South Korea, the Philippines where Americans are stationed a lot, Japan, then everything they've been doing in the, the Middle East, they're digging in the last 20 years. So uh, the whole time to turn something back, but now Russia's entered the war since the fall of the Soviet Empire then the Pope does the consecration. As Jesus says, it would be too late. But nevertheless, it's entrusted to his blessed mother. So that's why we don't need to worry. We didn't do what we've been told to do. We haven't done the differences in order to avoid the if. We're just not, humanity's not listening, and this is why it will unfold. But when, I think when we have that illumination of conscience, we're going to realise the sins of omission, the sins of commission, and everyone personally will realise we have no excuse. The evidence is clear and we'll know it, like that many judgment feeling, we'll know without words. We'll just know. So about the about this consecration and the timing and the fact that it was going to be done late, um, there's a couple things there. One, in 1982, Sister Lucia wrote a letter saying that, this is right after the Pope was shot the following year. She said that the errors of Russia have spread already. And, I mean, you can see it now, and we've talked about that a little bit before. So, the errors of Russia are in the West. They have spread to the West. And the areas are corruption, morals, decadence, you know, basically immorality. People tend to think differently. They, they tend to think, well, the areas of Russia is a communist dictatorship. And that's not what it is. It's not, it's not Stalin taking over the West. It's the immorality that was pushed by the communist. If you remember, they're not just communists, they're atheists. And that's the other aspect of it, the atheism that we see. Even though there may be lip service done to the fact that some nations are historically Christian, it's not represented in their laws any longer in the West. As a matter of fact, they're diligently working to remove them from their laws. So we have that part of it, and that's touches to the, that points to the fact that it would be done late. The other timing part of it, <clears throat> there's two things of it. And one in Father Gobi's blue book, a blessed mother told him that the consecration wasn't done, and this is after John Paul's consecration. 
which he really didn't use the word consecrate. He said entrustment, and people would jump on that to correct me about that. <laughs> but um, the other, standing by itself, I don't think that would be enough, but there is a stigmatist who was 100% right in this, and I've been trying to think of his name while you were talking. I think it was name was Ruffini back in the 1990s. He was a stigmatist, and of course, in Italy. And uh, he predicted that the consecration would be done. And again, this is a prediction, a prophecy after the 1984 entrustment by Pope John Paul II. He predicted that the consecration would not be done by this pope, and at the time that was Pope John Paul II. He said, and it would not be done by the pope after him, but by his successor, which would be Pope Francis. So he de his prophecy definitely came true because Pope Francis did perform the consecration. Now, I, I can't talk about that without getting some comments that Pope Francis did not do the consecration. And there's, there's all kinds of ideas about the consecration. There's one person who's a, a prominent apologist and very well-known Catholic author who claims that Pope Pius XII's consecration was valid, and that was the real consecration. But, and I find that to be like a, a fringe idea, but there's ideas all over the place. Some say that the consecration was never done. And there's some people that have been studying it for a long time. I don't want to use any names, but some people, I think, that the audience sort of recognize, they say the consecration was never done. And I don't believe that. And I, I think Pope Francis definitely did the consecration. And the people that don't believe that, they're say, I think that they are saying it because they don't believe that he's the Pope. Well, he is a Pope. And if you go in the Vatican, you, you stand in front of the cardinals and you ask them who the Pope is, they'll point to Pope Francis. <laughs> yeah. So they say that he's the Pope, and he is the Pope as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned. And if you don't like the Pope, that doesn't mean you have the authority to say he's not the Pope. We should not be saying things like that. In the history of the church, we've had some terrible popes. And um, some examples, like um, there was a pope that dug up his predecessor and put him on trial. Yeah, I'm thinking that one. There's, that's always the favorite for the scrapbook. But there was a pope who was very promiscuous. I think it was, there was maybe two popes that were like that. Had children. And uh, there was a couple popes for sure that spoke and taught heresy. Now, it may not, may not have been formal heresy, but they definitely spoke heresy. So popes are fallible human beings, just like everyone else here. Even the apostles, they, you could go back to, in Scripture, where St. Paul reprimanded um, St. Peter because of uh, his attitude he had towards the Gentiles, where he wanted the Gentiles to basically adhere to the traditions of the Jews to be considered Christians and followers of Christ. And St. Paul reprimanded him about that. So guess what? That means that St. Peter was wrong and St. Paul was right. So the first pope is showing some fallibility there. And people always mix that up with inf infallibility. The doctrine of infallibility is a very narrow doctrine. It's only used in certain circumstances when the intent is to be infallible. And a good example would be like the dogma of the assumption. But popes, like everyone else, are human beings, stewards yeah. of the church. So, 
even if a pope today is not a good pope in the eyes of many, he is still the pope. And we should not say that the consecration is not valid because we don't like him or we think he's not a good pope. As far as everyone's concerned, especially those who matter, which are the people who elected him, the cardinals, they're saying that he is the Pope. Well, I found him down in uh, a cathedral near London, Brentwood Cathedral, I believe. I don't know who the, the well-known speaker was, but he works closely in the Vatican at times and different things like that as well. And she said that this speaker, this gentleman said, you know, like, there is great one union and one heart with the cardinals and the Pope. It's just the very few cardinals that are causing a lot of havoc and they've got a lot of money behind them to do so. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. But as time went on, I was thinking, like, that evening or something, well, he has picked a lot of those cardinals as well. And the few that seem to be causing the so-called havoc are always turning back to tradition and church teachings and doctrine and that it came a week after hearing about one such saint it was the only one out of many many uh, priests and bishops that stood his ground for what was right and he was martyred for it and he was the one that became the saint and then again you look at St Thomas Moore I mean you wonder how he felt in the Tower of London in that all those years in prison from the luxurious life and status that he had mm -hmm. but he couldn't back up the king with his um, remarriage and all this divorce and remarriage stuff. And again, you look at Amoris Letizia. But, so I don't know if that's a good thing or maybe not a good thing. It's just a little side note, maybe. But with all this being said, then I'm just thinking of time as well, getting on to that other part. Do you think everything we've discussed that's to come, Garab and Dal, Medjugorje Secrets, whatever else is left, do you think there's anything to... Do you think there's any real faith to to have an open mind that this solar eclipse everyone's talking about is a sign from God? Or is it just one of those things that happens in the mathematical genius of the cosmos? No, we'd have to be spiritually tone deaf not to realize that that is a warning and a sign from God. So I think most of your audience is aware of the eclipse it's passing through a town called Jonah. I think it's one of the first towns that passes through the full eclipse. And then it goes through seven towns named Nineveh. And someone informed me recently, I haven't confirmed it myself, but someone said the seven towns of Nineveh in the United States are the only towns named Nineveh in the United States. So that would be a remarkable coincidence. I think it I think we need to be open to God's presence in the world, God speaking to us in the world. And if we don't recognize a sign like that, we're hopeless. It's yeah. kind of like what I'll tell you a similar thing. After the Pacamama incident, we had the plague and I don't want to say what it was, but happened right after the Pacamama incident, just a, a few months, actually it was occurring at the same time, but we didn't know it. The breakout already occurred. And it, it's hard to disassociate the two. If you're looking at the world through the eyes of the faith, you have to recognize the fact that there is this relationship. And we should recognize it. And we should be open to viewing it and actually look for it. Does that mean that everything is a chastisement, as an example, like every storm, every hurricane, or every volcano? No, not necessarily, but we need to be open to the fact that God speaks to us in our own lives, and we need to be aware of that and look for it. And I think this is a really good example where it's not just God speaking to an individual, but I think he's speaking to the whole world in this particular eclipse. 
Yeah, since, since I did the video myself, a few people have commented and said, although the original lists, which I saw elsewhere, seem to have been like seven in America and the one in Canada, but the way the eclipse goes, there's only like two or three maybe in direct line, but the others are on the same pathway in terms of the the direction the eclipse is going. I don't know if you watched my video about it, but I know where the eclipse ends because of the way the sun's spinning and that, but when it comes over the Atlantic, if it kept going just a little longer, it would have landed down near Garabandal, northern Spain, Really? the way the Wow. NASA projection has it on the global map. But um, Yeah. I did notice as well that the town of Jonah had several names before it was declared by, the, I think it was the Postal Services, in 1884. next to San, Ga San Gabriel, but again, 1884, straight away, Pope Leo XIII and his mystical vision, and then with the eclipse occurring the day after Divine Mercy Sunday, it's the Feast of the Annunciation, so St. Gabriel appeared to Mary, St. Yes. Gabriel at Jonah, where this eclipse began, there's, there's so many things, it's like a cosmos spirograph, how things come about in a great pattern, although you can't work out how. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the one of 2017 went the opposite way, and it was going through many towns called Salem, Shalom, Peace, now it's going this way, Jonah, Nineveh, and it's almost like, well, if you know the Bible story, And not to mention the 1884 coincidence linked to Jonah in this town, but the Bible's all clear with the eclipse, the warning to repent. And the fact that that's what the angel appeared to Sister Sasagawa after half a century or so, saying repent, put on sackcloth, read that story cause what, for the church. So there's clear warnings, that's been, and that coincided with the Pachamama time. So um, a lot to do with Nineveh seems to be coming back from... The Akita nun at the Pachamama stuff and what's happening with this eclipse as well. And uh, I, I do believe the eclipse will come and go and everyone will still be getting on with their day. But I think it's a clear sign that time is very short now. And you've Yes. got the November elections, which I think they're going to do everything they can to stop Trump getting in because the war machine will end again, like it did with them the first time. And you'll end up having the underbelly, the the deep state, or whatever you want to call those, and the corrupt positions doing everything to cause pandemonium again in America. So one other thing I want to mention before we move on to something else is the eclipse you mentioned, the previous eclipse, it crosses this eclipse that will occur. And this I'm not sure where I've seen it, but someone put it on the map and said where it crosses is a town called Palestine in the United States. So, I mean, it's stuff like that. I mean, there's too much coincidence not to pay attention. Right. Yeah. And there's plenty of examples in the Bible of where the like it's to do with the signs in the heavens. After all, the three wise men followed what we now believe to be some sort of comet, or the, the shining star in the sky to find the Messiah in the stable. You know, we have... Um, So in Matthew's gospel, we speak about the times where the blood, of, uh, the moon will turn blood red and the lights in the heavens would be extinguished. Again, in the diary of St. Faustina, which I have here on the desk, it's quite early on in that diary of mercy, not diary of wrath, the diary of divine mercy. He speaks again about the lights in the, the heavens would be extinguished. There are, I mean, Our Lady of Guadalupe, NASA, the amount of studies that NASA have done in Our Lady of Guadalupe image, the cosmos on our veil, the way they work out uh, Mm. what's the word with the distance, and the, 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 it's just perfect. All, all that stuff is God's creation. He uses everything that he's made in creation, uh, and as an expression of his love, his divine love. So, and for whatever reason, it just seems to... do it that way that's how he wills it but again i've done a video on the signs of around pope francis i was there in rome when he was elected pope as a seminarian and i was quite 
in the middle at the center. I got some great snaps. It's on my Facebook page and all that, all the memories. And um I noticed I, I don't it's on video, I've already done the research, but I can't remember the dates. The meteor landed in Argentina around about Conclave or some time. This was after the lightning strike the night Pope Benedict left the yes. church. Then there was the Argentinian meteor, which not everyone knows too much about because the big one was the other meteor in Russia. He gets selected in the March 13th, Putin's March 18th, and then the Chinese president's like the day after on the 19th, I believe. But the fact that these meteors are landing in the pontiff's homeland and the prophetic nation of Russia at the last number Pope of Malachi, at the prophesied time of the two Popes, at the completion of the four Popes of Carabindal. But everyone just focuses on the lightning strike at the Dome. It's like, what about the meteors in these countries at this time with all these coincidences? <laughs> then this eclipse. You know, I mean, heaven's given us the signs, you know? Yeah, it's definitely, we're getting very close. And, so. and I'm not worried about it. I mean, some people seem yeah. to get worried. I think years ago, reading some of this stuff, I may have had a knot in my stomach. But I think that's subsisted and long gone, thanks to coming to know God and love, coming to know the I don't faith. Know how many times, I don't know how many times that I hear commentaries from people, that you know, viewers, say that they're waiting and hoping for the warning. And they can't wait for it to happen <laughs> because they're tired of this nonsense. Or it—it it is, and actually, and they have a good point. It is um, actually it's a bit of a chastisement and a martyrdom for someone who maintains the faith to live in a world that's full of sin, that's rejecting the faith, and actually, there's some people that have talk to me about this, about the fact that they fear that there'll be a persecution of the faithful at some point beyond the persecution you currently see that's occurring. Like um, you see some persecutions of individuals that are doing nothing, like individuals, clergy, they're doing nothing but adhering to the faith, but they're not doing it in a manner that a certain bishop would wish them to do it in. Now they, a certain bishop would, uh, some bishops would like them to, or like to promote the idea of, of going away from the faith, thinking that it's progressive, you know, and they're applying political terms to the faith, which they shouldn't be, and political ideology to the faith, which they shouldn't be, and then they're persecuting clergy that or adhere into scripture and the magisterium and tradition. And they're, they're thinking that could get much worse and the states could become a um, actually a persecutor of the faithful also at some point. And some countries, they're already being persecuted, but, you know, like we just seen in Christmas in a small town in Africa, I think there was a hundred people that were massacred because they were Christians. So there's a concern that I may something maybe not like that, but something similar persecution that would occur in Western countries. You would not be allowed to um, live your faith, where your ideas would be against the law. And you see some of that. Some of that is coming around, you know. So you see some of that peeking through the, the darkness and making itself evident in some people's descriptions of what they think should happen and in some laws that are being implemented in different nations in, in the West. Yeah. I think we'll know very soon. And I, I don't just say that because of... I mean, I, I was saying 15 plus years ago when I was in the lay community or I started reading a couple of the books, you know, maybe 2017, the 100th anniversary. Is anyone's guess after then? And then it's like 1929, she came back and asked for the consecration. Maybe 2029, 20, 100 years. Maybe the 1960 deadline would be 2060, but 
I think that's far, far gone, that one. I think these, the Illuminati, stonecutter type people, as we'll say for the channel, is um, there's a reason by 2030 and with this great reset, some say whatever it is with the calendars, you know, 2033, the 2000 years since the birth of the church after Christ's passion and resurrection. Um, you had Pentecost and yeah, the new Pentecost is coming, but if we're off by three years, that's why these people of darkness might be putting it up as 2030, but it's the divine reset, it's God's reset that's going to kick in for sure. And um, I think we'll know by the by the time of the decades out for sure. And I'm expecting yeah. something in the next year or two with Moscow, to be honest. Yes, yeah, I, I expect something. And the other thing to consider, it looks like Pope Francis' his health is waning, and um, that's also a consideration as well. So regarding his trip to Moscow, if it's ever going to happen. Yeah. But I think it, it could be very soon. It seems like... The tension there is just augmenting, and just last night, I think, or yesterday, was a, a terrorist attack there in Moscow, a terrible one. Bad one, yeah. And <clears throat> the question is, you know, who actually did it and who was behind it? So that could lead to something also, you know, a further escalation. We don't, we don't know. So... The tension is just increasing. It's ratcheting up more and more. And it seems like it's not getting better. And there's no leadership out here in the West regarding how to fix anything. You know, so <clears throat> there's no leadership that says, this is what we must do, like adults, and overcome this turmoil that we're in with Russia and the Ukraine prevent it from spreading. As a matter of fact, you get the opposite from like Macron. Oh, we need to send troops over there. We need, there's no red lines. Okay. It, it's, it reminds me of like, a, I don't know, like a, a little cartoon character speaking to a giant, you know, like, there's no red lines. We're going to go over there and knock you silly. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. So, what are you, you know, what are you asking? Now, the problem is, even though, if it wasn't for NATO, the alliance of NATO, he wouldn't have anything to say at all because he has no capability of doing anything against Russia. So, unless he wants to take France into an extinction event, but. The idea is that NATO would back anything that would happen between France and Russia. Yes. And that's unfortunate. That, that goes back to the World War I scenario that we started out with. We have these alliances that bring in other nations that were not attacked, but they end up being party to the war and being directly involved in a war. The only other thing I'd say, maybe we can talk on it next time, just came to mind. If there's a sense of peace that comes about after the papal visit to Moscow, this isn't going to go down well with Western leaders and those that are trying to keep this going. So in a way, the Pope, who's always in the top three of world's top influencers, according to Forbes magazine or whatever other ones I used to see the, the little bit, it's always the Pope being in the top three, sometimes number one or number two. If that type of status of who he is and he goes and makes this sense of peace and things like that, that's going to not go down well with the West and those who want to keep pushing for war and everything else. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that might be a way of sparking to to deal with him. And that's where the Trefontani prophecies, maybe the Fatima third secret with the vision, the Pope in the second half in ruins. The, you know, there's a few prophecies with the Pope being shot and things, that might be something we can maybe cover as the last note on that, maybe for a future video, perhaps.
because you can see, kind of sense something's going to come with that. And I think, again, with this invasion of Europe, with illegal migrants, Marie Julie Jeheni and others I've spoke about as well, I think everything's coming in context. And it's just a case of waiting for the spark. And it might be hidden within that. Yeah, so um, the thing about that is the Ukrainian nation, or government, I should say, right now, is completely dependent upon NATO. Um, they really can't do anything without NATO. So they're dependent completely for aid and for armaments. So if NATO said tomorrow we want this war to be ended, it will be ended. If they say tomorrow we want this war to continue, it's going to continue. Because the government that's there right now cannot exist without the assistance of NATO. And that's my diplomatic way of saying it's a puppet government. <laughs> <laughs> so even if the Pope goes there and Moscow has a, a, a positive reaction to his visit, I, I don't think it really would matter regarding him visiting Ukraine unless the West wants them to take a certain different direction, like they want to start negotiations. But so far, it doesn't look like that's what they want to do. And I'm not sure what the end is. I mean, it's, it's obvious. The Pope wasn't wrong So when we started the video off. The Pope was not wrong in what he said. He said very clearly, he says, when a nation is facing defeat or it's not going well, then there's no shame in hoisting the flag, the white flag of negotiation. Mm. And he stated what he, he viewed the situation very clearly. And others are saying the same thing. I mean, unfortunately, they're trying to speak with one voice in the West, but there's other voices within the West saying that it's not going well for Ukraine. It hasn't been going well for a long time. Their army is pretty much decimated, and their armaments have been depleted as the armaments in the West have. So if you don't have, if you want to continue a war and you don't have armaments, what do you do? You maybe escalate to the next level of armament if you wish to continue, or you have peace. I think that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the sane people win the day. Well, with the time going then with a lot of good stuff uh, covered, I just invite everyone to leave their comments and be open and productive. Anything else to share that can further enhance future discussions, please get your comments in or your ideas in below. And I, I just give you this moment, Bob, if you want to finish off with any last words uh, before the next time we see you. No, it's just a pleasure being here once again. You know, I love chatting with you. And we could probably continue talking for a long time. As a matter of fact, we before the video, we started talking a bit. And we actually had to catch ourselves and say, we should be actually recording this now. <laughs> because this is the way we would normally talk when we get together and talk. <laughs> yeah, and it goes in so fast when it's so good, doesn't it? It's like, whoa, 15, 20 minutes, we have to hit the record button. <laughs> <laughs> you have got a great wealth of knowledge. Uh, you're well read up and revised, and uh, I'm enjoying your videos the more and more I discover, uh, especially that one I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I think it was the Spirit of the Antichrist or something with Fulton Sheen and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Really worth watching, people, as well as other videos. So give us the thumbs up, you know what to do, hit the subscribe, the bell notification. How many more people need to hear this or would like to hear it, please hit the share button and do it. And don't forget to check Bob's channel out at Elijah's Cloak. And until next time, don't worry, fear is useless, as Padre Pio says. Pray, hope, and don't worry. God bless and see you next time. Thank you and God bless.